Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Abigail Rodriguez and I will be the host of today's Ohio ISS educational downlink event. I want to welcome everyone that has joined us virtually, including the I Promise School, Cleveland School of Science and Medicine, Horizon Science Academy, Denison Middle School, the Ginn Academy, Admiral King Elementary, Parma Community Middle School, Warrensville Heights Elementary School, and our partners at the Great Lakes Science Center, home of our NASA Glenn Visitor Center, who are hosting first robotics teams from John Marshall School of Information Technology, East Technical High School, MC Squared STEM High School, and Davis Aerospace and Maritime High School. Welcome everyone. We have an exciting program for all of you today, which includes our feature live downlink connection to the International Space Station, a presentation and Q&A with astronaut Stephanie Wilson, a hands-on activity session, and a preview of the upcoming launch of Artemis 1, the first launch of NASA's Space Launch System rocket carrying the Ohio, the Orion spacecraft that will kick off NASA's return to the moon and beyond. At this time, I would like to introduce several key leaders. Dr. Marla Perez Davis, director of NASA's Glenn Research Center. The Honorable Mike DeWine, the governor of Ohio and the Honorable Justin Bibb, the mayor of the city of Cleveland, who will be providing opening remarks. Good morning, students, and welcome to our International Space Station Educational Downlink event. I am Dr. Marla Perez Davis, the director of NASA's Glenn Research Center, and I would like to congratulate you for taking the opportunity to join us for this special event with NASA astronaut Stephanie Wilson and the other astronauts currently flying on the space station. During this event, you are going to learn about living and working in space directly from the astronauts themselves. For more than 80 years, NASA Glenn and the state of Ohio have been contributing to space exploration and aviation. Our space exploration efforts start about 260 miles above our heads, orbiting around the Earth aboard the International Space Station. NASA Glenn supports several experiments on the space station focus on building life support systems, medical devices, exercise equipment that will help our astronaut live for long periods on the moon and eventually Mars. We're also studying how fluids and fire act in microgravity. By understanding how they behave in space, we can improve flight system performance, fire detection and prevention technologies. The lessons we learn and the technologies we develop on space station are helping prepare NASA to send astronauts back to the moon for the first time in 50 years. And this time, it is not just about flags and footprints. We call this effort Artemis, and we are going to send the first woman and the first person of color to the moon as we work to establish a long-term human presence on and around the moon. NASA Glenn plays a significant role in Artemis, including hardware development and testing for the Orion spacecraft, the Space Launch System rocket, and the lunar outpost we call Gateway. We will use what we learn on the moon under Artemis to prepare for humanity's next giant leap, sending astronauts to Mars. Without a doubt, the journey to the moon and Mars goes through Ohio. What inspires me even more is that all this groundbreaking research and testing also makes life better and safer here on Earth. However, all the great work NASA is doing cannot happen without talented and inspired minds like yours. You are what we call our Artemis generation, and you will continue to work what we have started to make sure we are successful on the moon, and you will send people to Mars. Before we get started, I would like to thank Senators Cheryl Brown and Rob Portman, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine, and Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibb for their support for this event for NASA and for the STEM education across Ohio. I hope today's event inspires you to pursue classes and careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and perhaps one day 
you will be joining us behind the gates of NASA Glenn. Good morning, I'm Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and welcome to this exciting NASA event coming to us live from the International Space Station. We're so honored to have these American heroes, our astronauts, with us today. Ohio is proud of its 80-year history with NASA, which is leading our nation in technology development in space and here on Earth. NASA's aeronautics, technology, science, and STEM efforts at the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland and the world-class Neil A. Armstrong Test Facility in Sandusky, Ohio, are both named after American legends from Ohio. We hope you enjoy this opportunity today, and what a special event. I hope the conversation inspires you to reach new heights and to work for the betterment of mankind. Godspeed as you reach for the stars. Hey there, I'm Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibb. I'd like to welcome you to this exciting NASA astronaut event coming to us live from the International Space Station today. You know, it's not every day you have a chance to talk to real astronauts in space. Take this opportunity to be curious and learn how STEM can be applied in careers with NASA. Science, technology, engineering and math, or STEM as we call it in school, is an important part of our daily lives and in our cities. As mayor of Cleveland, I know how important STEM is to our success. I'm proud to say that NASA has been working in Cleveland for over 80 years, generating nearly $2 billion towards our economy. There are over 3,000 employees today. Many started studying STEM just like you. The NASA Glenn Research Center helps lead our nation in space and on Earth. And now is your chance to ask questions that could change your life and maybe one day, life on Earth as we know it. Godspeed, God bless, thank you so much. Thank you so much to Dr. Perez Davis, Governor Mike DeWine, and Mayor Bibb for your leadership, support, and those inspiring words. Now, it is the time to connect with the astronauts on board the International Space Station. Students from our participating schools have submitted questions that will be answered live from space by astronauts on board the International Space Station. Let's go live to Johnson Space Center in Houston for the downlink. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready. Houston ACR, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Houston ACR. How do you hear me? Station has you loud and clear. Please stand by for opening remarks. I'm Sherrod Brown. It's a privilege to serve the people of Ohio and the United States Senate. Welcome to the students, the educators, and just simply space lovers tuning in from Ohio and across the world for today's downlink Q&A. Ohio has always been a leader in aerospace and aviation. From the Wright brothers to John Glenn, from our aerospace companies in Dayton to the cutting edge research at NASA Glenn, scientists, researchers, engineers across the whole state, we are an aerospace state, make this work possible. Thanks for tuning in today. Thank you for celebrating our nation's amazing advancements in space. Hi, my name is Alex Light from Emerald King Elementary, Lorraine, Ohio. When training to, my question is, when training to go to space, what activities do you have to do to prepare yourself? 
Hi, Alex. So when we're training to go to space, we spend about two years initially in what's called ASCAN or astronaut candidate training, where we do a series uh, of training to get us ready for kind of any mission and to get ready for the space station. And then once you're assigned, you do more specific training for whatever that uh, expedition or mission will be. So Tom and I came up here on the Crew 3 mission and are on Expedition 66. So a lot of our training was specific to the science on board. In terms of training during ASCAN, there's five major parts. There's robotics training. We learn Russian because uh, part of the space station is Russian. So to be able to work with them, we learn how to speak Russian. We also do training in spacewalks or EVAs. Uh, we do a lot of training on the International Space Station systems to learn how to fix it and operate it. And then we also do training in the T-38, which is an airplane uh, that we use to work on what we call space resource management. When we work as crews in the airplane, it's very similar to how we work as crews in space. Hi, my name is Imani, and I'm from the Cleveland School of Science and Medicine in Ohio. And my question is, is that if you had to live on the space station for the rest of your life, what three items would you take with you? Hi, Imani. Boy, that's a tough question to answer. However, I assume you mean I can't bring my family. Now, they might not want to come live with me for the rest of our lives on the space station. But if I couldn't bring my family, I would probably bring... You know, we have so much stuff for, uh, that's wonderful here with science. I would bring things like probably a paint set. I would bring a library, whether that's a Kindle with uh, all the greatest uh, literature that I could find. I'd have a lot of time to read. That would be good. And I would probably bring a musical instrument to let my creative side grow. So that would probably be it. Hi, my name is Jamaya. Here is my question. My team has been really interesting in how fluid behave in space. Can you demonstrate how water behaves and explain why? Yeah, sure, Jeremiah. So one of the really cool things about water uh, in, in forces in general, so on Earth, uh, there's always different forces acting on things, and gravity often is the dominant one. Here in space, there's microgravity, and so you can see here the dominant force is surface tension. So it turns out water molecules really like to stick together. Uh, and so instead of falling or dispersing like they do on Earth, they stick to things. So whether that's my hand or whether that's the straw, uh, it's a, both fun and interesting. And the way, reason it's interesting is not only does water behave differently in space, but a whole lot of different materials and molecules behave differently in space when the forces that govern them aren't always dominated by gravity. And so that helps us discover new materials and new ways of making materials. Um, and so water oftentimes is a really good analog for us to look at to understand with a very simple non-toxic substance before we do more complicated experiments with things that are maybe a little more uh, dangerous or, or have to be contained a little bit more uh, carefully. Hello, my name is Fernanda from the I Brown School in Akron, Ohio. How do you analyze data from the space station? Well, there certainly is a lot of data come from the space station, both on the health of the space station and all the scientific data we're putting down. So the way we do it is we have big antennas on the space station. We downlink, so we have to have good communication. Uh, we probably bounce it off a satellite and get it down to all the mission controls around the world and all the uh, scientists around the world. And so they collect that data. And it's, it's really nice to have to know that mission control is down there watching the health and status of the space station because they're watching us every minute of every day, 24 four hours a day, 365 days a year, to make sure that the space station is healthy, they're keeping us alive and keeping the mission going. Hi, my name is Mia. I'm from Parma Community Middle in Parma, Ohio. My question is, what is the most interesting experience you've had in space? Thank you. I mean, I think for me, the most interesting thing was uh, helping Tom and Kayla go do a spacewalk. And so uh, earlier in our mission, uh, they went out to fix what's called an S-band antenna, which is one of the antennas, as Tom mentioned, that we use to transmit data back and forth to the ground. And so they went out to replace that antenna. As part of that, uh, Matthias and I and Mark, the other three uh, crew members up here on the U.S. segment, had to suit them up and then send them out the airlock, which is pretty cool to put your friend into a spacesuit and then send them outside into space. And then once they're out there, what was even better is we got to move Tom around on the robotic arm and so we practice and train a lot for that on the ground but actually having your friend be out there on the end of an arm you're moving uh, in space was a pretty amazing experience
I am Sebastian Gilsis. I am from Horizon Denison Science Academy in Cleveland, Ohio. And I want to ask, how do you get fresh water to drink in outer space? And how do you specifically stay clean? Hey, Sebastian. Well, I tell you, we uh, can fly water up to the space station, but water is actually pretty heavy. We want to reclaim as much as we can so we can use all that uh, all that space on the spaceships that come to us for scientific equipment and food and those kinds of things. So we reclaim the water that comes out of our bodies and it may come out of the sweat and maybe the water that uh, comes out when we go to the bathroom. But we have these wonderful purifiers that clean that water and we can get about 93% of the water reclaimed, which is a, actually a wonderful thing and essential before we go to Mars because we're going to need about 98% reclamation rate in order to be able to go to Mars so we don't have to carry too much water with us. Uh, the way we stay clean is we use wet wipes. We don't have a running water up here. We can't take showers or baths like you might think, but it's actually pretty nice. We have just uh, gauze towels or thick towels that we wet and then rub all over ourselves with a little bit of soap and then do it again to get the soap off. And uh, that's how we stay clean. My name is Jockeys Cameron, I'm from Guinea Academy in Cleveland, Ohio. My question is, as an astronaut, what is your favorite thing to do in your free time? Well, one of the things is just getting around. And so uh, it's the ability to just float and move around uh, with just fingertips and slight pushes and fly through modules, kind of like a feeling like Superman shooting through things is pretty fun. And that's just getting around from task to task. And what my, really my favorite thing to do in my free time is to go look out the window. So we have what's called the cupola, uh, which is both a window that we use for when we're running the robotic arm, but also gives us a great opportunity to look outside um, and see the earth below us, see the city lights at night, uh, see the oceans and see the, the cities and the country during the day so it's a pretty amazing view uh, and that's definitely my favorite thing to do when I've got free time. I like to dance. Can you dance in the ISS in space? Hi Tracy. I think it would be fun to uh, have uh, more dancing up here. We do a little bit of it. Uh, we do play music up here. So I uh, We'll demonstrate something that's not exactly a dance, but it kind of looks like it. And this is a way that you can demonstrate angular momentum. It's the way a cat turns. If you ever wonder how a cat can always land on its feet, this is how it does it. Excuse me. How's that? So that's some that's some serious hip shaking going on. Hi, my name is Ali. We heard most of the food you eat is dehydrated to save space and reduce launch weight. Here's my question. Do you, how do you prepare food in space and do you have a favorite? So Ali, we have a, a few different ways to prepare and store food up here. Uh, so we have both uh, freezers and heaters. Uh, we use the freezers mostly for science, but we can also use them for food. So we got a special delivery of some popsicles with uh, our last Cygnus cargo vehicle. Once the food's up here, uh, then we prepare it a few different ways. So we have kind of a uh, traditional dehydrated food and so that's uh, cashew chicken curry but without any water in it and so basically you we hook it up to a water dispenser we add the water back in uh, and then after about five or ten minutes of letting the water soak in and keeping it in a heater then it's ready to eat the other type of food we have is, is pre-packaged so it's not dehydrated um, those are candy coated chocolates and so Basically, those are just like you would have on Earth. So there's some food that if it's not perishable uh, and not stuff that will go bad, you can just fly it up uh, packaged and we're able to eat it here. This stays in the bag, though, as you can see, it'd be pretty hard to control all those little guys once they get out of the bag. So you got to be ready to eat them when they come out. The other thing that uh, we do is actually grow our own plants. And so uh, while we've been up here, we got to eat some hatched chilies that uh, the previous expedition grew. And then we started growing some lettuce. And the reason we're doing that is not only because it's great and uh, uh, delicious, but really we're also researching that for our eventual return to the moon and to stay on the moon and go to Mars, we'll be able to, uh, we need to be able to grow our own plants. We can't haul it all with us. Just like water, it's really heavy to bring all that stuff with us. So we're working on the technologies that we need to be able to grow um, sustainable uh, food for astronauts and for future humans on other planets. My name is Cameron. I am from Parma Community Middle School in Parma, Ohio. 
My question is, what has been your favorite experiment on the International Space Station? That's a really hard question to answer. Uh, they're all extremely exciting, and uh, we're very honored to be a part of them. Uh, the most recent one I worked on, which I thought was very interesting, was I was taking skin cells, human skin cells, that had been grown in a Petri dish, and they flew them up here in these little pellets, and they were looking at the effects of the radiation of space and the zero-G effects on skin cells. And it turns out that being in space tends to age our bodies faster, much, much faster, in terms of bone loss, muscle atrophy, effects on the skin ages as much faster than it does on the ground so this is an opportunity to uh, take some human uh, human organ the skin is the largest organ uh, on the human body and to see what all those effects are and that way we can come up with ways to help prevent the aging help prevent the damage to the skin cells and get the results a lot faster so that's been a fascinating one to work on Hi, my name is Mikura Vera from Parma Community Middle in Parma, Ohio. And my question is, how do plants grow in space? Well, Enrique, they, uh, we have a few different ways we try to grow them up here. Um, you can't quite see it, but just off screen here is we have, we call them veggie pillows. And it's essentially a uh, plastic bellows with a plate on the bottom. And that lets us control the lighting uh, of the of the plants. And that particular experiment, we are looking at different ways to deliver water and nutrients to the plants in a, in a less user intensive way, meaning that it was a passive system, letting the, wa the plants absorb their own water. We have another system uh, in the Japanese module, the gem we call it that is a much uh, more controlled thing kind of like a hydroponic system on the on the earth where we're controlling the gas flow and the nutrients and everything into the plants and so there's a few different methods of doing that and we're, we're trying to figure out what's the best way and the most time efficient way and also things like what's the the lightest way um, and the ones that get this, the healthiest plants the fastest so there's a few different ways we do that the uh, the third type of research we're doing on plants and growing is actually growing them at the cellular level and so one of the really cool things about growing cells in space is without gravity, uh, when you grow large, big chunks of cells on the Earth, they get, they get flattened out. But when there's microgravity, they can grow three-dimensionally, and so you can get larger structures to study faster. So we're doing that with cotton plants uh, to try to find cotton that is more drought-resistant to help the Earth, but also to understand uh, how to grow chunks of plant cells in space better. Hi, my name is Trishel Edmonds, and I am from Horizon Science Academy, Denison Middle, in Cleveland, Ohio. And my question is, is it hotter or cold in outer space? Hi, Trishel. That is a great question, and the answer is yes, it's both. It all depends on what part of the object or your body is facing the sun. We have direct uh, UV and all the other types of uh, electromagnetic radiation come from the sun, and it can be 250 degrees Fahrenheit if you're facing the sun. The other side of you or of the object is in shadow, and that can be negative. 250 degrees Fahrenheit. We can actually feel that when we're out on a spacewalk. We can feel a little bit of the difference. Of course, the suit is protecting us between the really hot and the really cold all at the same time. My name is Treshawn Weekly, and I am from Ginn Academy in Cleveland, Ohio. My question is, how old do you have to be to be able to go into space, and how do you eat in space? So, Treshawn, there's really no age limit that we know of to, to come up in space. Um, usually the people that uh, have come up in the past have been uh, have already graduated college, and that's kind of a relic of the fact that you have certain requirements to be an astronaut at NASA. But as far as we know scientifically, we don't really have an age limit per se. In terms of what we eat up here, or how we eat, uh, we eat very similar uh, to the way you do on the ground, except we have a really long spoon to dig into packages. We don't You don't open the package up, because otherwise food would go everywhere. So we have these really long handle spoons to dig down. And then the other thing that's a little different about eating up here is we track everything we eat. Um, and so every time you have a snack, a drink, food, we log it. Um, and then that way the people on the ground uh, can keep track of exactly what's going into our bodies. Like Tom mentioned, a lot of the science is understanding how our bodies change in space. And so to, to understand the full equation, you have to know what's going into your body so you can analyze what comes out of your body. And so there's also some studies that Tom and I are a part of where we're actually deliberately choosing different types of food to see if those have uh, different effects 
effects than some of the other crew members. So specifically seeing some, some lycopene and omega-3 and some other types of food and nutrients that they're looking at to see if that stops some of the aging and the damage to the cells that we typically see uh, in the space environment. Hi, my name is Braylon. The members of our robotic team are learning about the importance of teamwork. My question is, how important is teamwork aboard the International Space Station? And how do crew members train to work effectively together? You know, teamwork up here is actually it's essential for our survival and essential for getting things done up here. It's just way too complicated for any one person to do it. So uh, teamwork is something we actually train on quite a bit before we fly. And some of the ways we do that is, first of all, we all learn together. We're in classrooms together. We're in simulators together. We learn how each other thinks. We learn how we um, at what people like and what they don't like. And that's all very important. You get to really get to know your crewmates. Uh, sometimes they will put us out in an uncomfortable situation, which sometimes is a lot of fun. It might be a survival trip in the mountains, backpacking in the mountains or in the canyons. Uh, so we can really get to know ourselves, kind of get to know what our limits are and how we can help each other out. And all this is really important for developing teamwork and a good team culture before we fly. My name is Preston Thompson, and I go to the I Promise School in Akron, Ohio. I have questions about sleeping routines, like where do you guys sleep and how gravity works when you sleep. Hey Preston, so where we sleep is actually in the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. So actually behind me, our crewmate Matthias, our German astronaut, that's his crew quarters. And so there's a uh, one here and there's four in another module and Tom's going to show you basically he's just going to go into what looks like the ceiling but up here you can't tell it's a ceiling or not and inside there is about the size of a sleeping bag and a computer and that's what we use it for is to sleep and then also to be able to do things like get work done in the evenings uh, and correspond with people at home uh, in terms of what how gravity works in in your sleep it's kind of the same as it does during the day so you would tend to float around different people like to do different things when they sleep some people like to be restrained and to feel uh, very wrapped up. Some people like to float around. Um, one thing that takes your brain some time to get used to is when you're in space the first few days, you always feel like you're falling. So as soon as you close your eyes, you get the sensation that you're still moving and still falling forward. So it's really hard to fall asleep at first because your brain just doesn't want to go to sleep when it feels like it's falling down. So it takes a few days for your brain to adjust to that to be able to sleep normally. Um, but once that happens, uh, it's just personal preference on how tightly you want to be held by, we use bungee cords to hold us down. Uh, and it just depends on how tight you want to be held down while you're sleeping. My name is London Davis. My question is, do you miss your family and can you talk to them from space? Hi, London. Yeah, we all miss our families quite a bit. And so the good thing is we are able to email them. It's not always as fast as on the ground because we have to bounce off a satellite. Uh, we can have video conferences with them and uh, actually see their faces and have a real-time conversation with them. And that's about every week. But very importantly, we can actually make a phone call. We can call them, but they can't call us back. And so uh, those are the three best ways, I think, that we can keep in touch with the family. And just about every day we're in touch with our families. Hi, I'm U.S. Senator Rob Portman. I just wanted to take a moment to celebrate this unique NASA astronaut event taking place at the Glenn Research Center with all of you. To the students, the educators, and our leaders at the Ohio Department of Education who are critical to our robust STEM education here in Ohio, congratulations. Our flourishing STEM programming across the state is one of the reasons the Buckeye State continues to play a leading role in the future of spaceflight. It's always great to see students take advantage of the STEM education opportunities. I know some of you are tuning in from the Great Lakes Science Center, which is a perfect example of Ohio's STEM education in action. Uh, I, I love that center. I love the fact that uh, young people are able to go there and to get hands-on experiences and therefore get more interest and in involvement in science. I've even seen an eclipse there. That's where I chose to be for the eclipse uh, at NASA Glenn and, and at the center. Anyway, it's my honor to represent all of you in the United States Senate. Best of luck in your future and hope to get to see you soon back in Ohio. Thanks very much, Senators, and uh, to all the kids in the schools there. Enjoyed answering your questions, and we'll leave you with a, a view of our uh, astro bees, our robots. Have a good afternoon. 
Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank you to the Expedition 66 crew members for answering the questions asked by the students. I hope you all enjoyed this portion of the program as much as I did and feel inspired to become NASA's next generation of explorers.